Um, can we just um, greet our internet audience this morning? <laughs> Thank you. It may only be one or two, but we're going to greet them anyway, right? So, hey, we're going to pick up in our series on 10-4. Anybody been here for that so far? All right, what we're trying to do is learn to be better communicators and better listeners of God so that he can lead us and help us. Say, we need some help. I think everybody needs to say, we need some help. We need some help. We need some help today. Um, and as I go forward, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change up my teaching style a little bit. I usually teach what's called a topical style. Um, and this week, I'm going to teach what is the expository style. And I did not say suppository. I said expository. And basically, all that means is we're going we're gonna to take a, a, a passage of Scripture and allow it to speak to us. Because I've been telling you every week, we want to hear God's voice. God speaks through his word. They don't call it the word for nothing. You know, they don't walk around calling it the text. It's the word. And we're going to let a passage of that speak to us and speak to our series this morning. Now, the passage we're going to read and go through is from the Gospel of St. Mark. And I think it's important to point out that Mark was a disciple and interpreter of Peter. So when we read Mark's account, we're basically reading Peter's eyewitness account. And as we know, Peter was Jesus' rock, like literally <laughs> his rock. And Peter was also there. He was, he was his right-hand man. Now, it doesn't mean Mark was not there. Um, the gospel records Mark's presence throughout that, those passages as well. He was actually, scholars say, he was probably the young man who ran away naked when Jesus was arrested, which just sounds like a bad episode of Cops to me. What? And I just pray that none of us have ever run away naked from a crime scene. Just two? Two? That's not three. Okay. That's not bad. I was in my underwear, so I can't, I can't count. All right, I've got to reel this thing back because we're going to <laughs> we're gonna get into the verses here. And hey, just out of reverence, can we, can we stand as I read, um, read this out? Reading from Mark 7, um, verses 31 through 37, it says... Jesus left Tyre and went up to Sidon before going back to the Sea of Galilee and the region of the Ten Towns. A deaf man with a speech impediment was brought to him, and the people begged Jesus to lay his hands on the man to heal him. Jesus led him away from the crowd so they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears, then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's tongue. Looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Athatha, which means be opened. Instantly the man could hear perfectly, and the tongue was freed so he could speak plainly. Jesus told the crowd not to tell anyone, but the more he told them not to, the more they spread the news. They were completely amazed and said again and again, Everything he does is wonderful. He even makes the deaf to hear and gives speech to those who cannot speak. Father, will you do an afatha with us today, Lord? Will you open our ears, Lord? Will you loosen our tongues to proclaim your name as they did, as wonderful and amazing? In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you can have a seat. I'm not used to having everybody stand. You know, I go to a lot of weddings, and uh, sometimes, nowadays, they have a lot of rent -a priests and a lot of times they will tell everybody to stand as, as the bride walks down the aisle, which is perfectly appropriate, but they never tell the people to sit back down. So during a half an hour service and everybody's like kind of getting sore, like, can I sit? Can I sit? Anyway, hey, so this is a series about communicating better. And this is a passage where Jesus in the miraculous is helping a man to communicate better. As a church, we are consistently trying to communicate better. It's one of the reasons why record, we're recording the services now, so we can help people that aren't able to be here or people that maybe miss something, want to go back and see what they missed. Um, they will have a resource to do that. Now, I went back and looked at the tape, so to speak, last week, and I'll tell you what, I've got a lot of work to do. I am not... <laughs> I'm not leaving here for televangelism anytime soon after looking at that tape. You know, I'm pacing back and forth like I've got to go to the bathroom. I'm not making eye contact with people. Uh, and for a camera, I'm stepping into the light and into the shade. That might be fine here, but it's not good for a fine, sophisticated camera like an iPhone 5S. It just completely gets lost when that happens. You know, some of the scripture I wanted to read, I literally got some words wrong. I got passages backwards. Um, <laughs> 
And that was before some of the things that kind of naturally happened, like the fire trucks and the police trucks. We had a guy that rode his bicycle behind me with a six pack. Um, another guy walked by picking his nose. Um, and if you were here last week, um, I don't know if she's here. I don't know a better way to say this, but a drunk lady came up and tried to help me finish my service. So it had to be Judy. It, it is. It is what. No, not you, Miss O. Not you. <laughs> not you. I think I'm wrong because my notes just blew away. Um, I love you too, and you know what? We prayed for you during service, and I don't see that neck brace on you anymore. The Lord is good. The Lord is good, but despite of me, but despite of, despite of what I'm trying to do, um, you know, I was just thinking, golly, I hope none of the other greenhouse pastors watch that. You know, I put it on the internet. I'm like, I hope nobody watches this. And it made me think. It's like. Why do people come to see this? <laughs> Thank you. We have faith, you'll change. Exactly, exactly. And there's my point. We're coming, not for the soup. Kevin, you make awesome soup. They were licking the bowl last week. They don't come to sit. People don't come to sit in the parking lot in the middle of September. People don't come to hear me. They come seeking. They come seeking what's in the text. They come seeking God's voice. They're coming seeking God's promises that he made for your life. Are they true? Are they real? Are they going to happen? I've been waiting. They come listening to what God is going to say through his pastors, through his people, through his worship. Now, if you were here last week, you'll know we talked about this. We're not very good listeners. We can hear all right. We can hear a lot of noise. But we're not good listeners, and I don't mean that just for us. I mean the church in general. I think it's part of the reason why churches have grown to be so big and fat and rich and, and mega. Amen. And on the downside of that, because they become a little stagnant, and eventually they end up smelling like mothballs. Has anybody ever been in a church that smelled like mothballs? It's not pretty. It's not alive. It's not alive, and I believe that happens because after a while the people come and they stop listening. They stop getting understanding. They stop getting things that they can apply to their lives. So what they do is they end up living a life where they just religiously go back to be reminded of what they were taught the week before. And that's not what we're here for. They might have gotten confused with the mortuary. <laughs> might have gotten it confused for the mortuary. But it got me thinking, maybe there is some, we're, we're reading about a passage about a deaf man. Maybe there's some deafness in the church. And maybe we can even look inward and say maybe there's a little bit of deafness in us. Now, I'm not talking about tone deaf. I'm talking about spiritual deafness. It's like this. It's like we get the check of knowledge, but sometimes we don't deposit it in our heart as understanding. I can write all kinds of numbers on a check, but it's worthless until you get it in the bank, right? It's worthless until you deposit it. So how do we know at what kind of understanding that we're receiving? Check your balance. Go to the ATM and check your balance. Because if you know, are you waking up? Are you waking up in the wilderness? Or are you waking up in the promised land? The land of your promises. The land of your blessings because if you're waking up day in and day out in the wilderness, you may have a listening problem. This is the wilderness. This is the wilderness. We may have, we may have a listening problem. Now, another way to look at this is, is our own tongues. I believe our tongues are like a dipstick to what is in our heart. And ultimately, everything that we hear and listen to ends up in our heart. So as we read this passage about a deaf man who could not speak, why could he not speak well? because he could not hear well. So we can judge what it is that we're hearing and what we're listening to by, by what comes out of our mouths. Amen? So I believe, I believe we're going to look inward today, and this just isn't a passage about a deaf man, but possibly a deaf church. And we are the church. It's not just the gathering. It's each of us that come individually. So as we start looking into this scripture, as we start getting into Mark chapter 7, we find Jesus traveling back um, from Tyre and Sidon back to the Sea of Galilee. And scholars believe that this was a long trip, almost a vacation from the ministry for Jesus. 
Now, the way my mind works, the way my mind works is like an excursion to Orlando. Anytime I think about a trip, I think about theme parking in Orlando. So I just have this vision, and I probably shouldn't, of Jesus kind of walking back. He's got the I Survive Splash Mountain shirt on. He's got the hat with the big ears. You know, maybe some cotton candy. And maybe I shouldn't have said that. But it's what I'm thinking, right? It's what I'm thinking. Actually, actually sticking to the text, what happens is Jesus comes into a town and he's greeted with a multitude of people. The town is called Decapolis, which literally means ten cities, ten cities within the region. And Jesus is met, and it's, it's, it's a Jewish region, and it's also a Gentile region, and it's also known as the Rome away from Rome. And as Jesus enters the town and he's met with the multitude of people, he's, prevent, he's presented with a man who has a hard time hearing and can barely speak. Now, I want us to put ourselves into this man's shoes. And in fact, I'm going to give him a name. I'm going to add to scripture, which I need you to pray for me about. I'm just going to add a name for the sake of our teaching today. Let's just call him Bob. Okay? Let's call him Bob. Good one syllable, easy to remember. Not put a lot of pressure on everybody. Now, let's step into his shoes because to be Bob in this time and this place was probably not too friendly for the handicapped. They did not have hearing aids. They did not have closed caption television. They didn't have special stickers that you can park your donkey right up next to the door at the mall. And they didn't certainly didn't have political correctness back then. And they didn't have malls either, but they had donkeys. They didn't have political correctness. You see, we might call it hearing impaired. We may call it speech impediment. They just called it deaf and dumb. And it's probably good Bob was deaf because any time he tried to speak, they probably made fun of him. But thank God for the people of faith. Because who was it that recognized that they needed to get Bob in front of Jesus? The people that recognized Jesus' divinity. Recognized who Jesus was. And I imagine it like this. I imagine they saw the poster. Hey, the big guy's coming tonight at 7. They, maybe Jesus checked in on Foursquare or they got the Facebook event. However it may be that they heard that Jesus was coming, they immediately said, where's Bob? We've got to find Bob. Bob, where are you? Of course, he couldn't hear, so they had to go looking for Bob. And they find Bob, and we've got to get you here. Because Bob doesn't know who Jesus is. Bob didn't hear. Nobody could explain. Can you imagine trying to explain to Bob who the Messiah is? Well, Bob, it kind of goes like this, and you know, he was um, the son of the son of man became the son of God, so the son of men could be the sons of God. And what? Huh? No, just come on, Bob, come with us. So they bring Bob in front of Jesus. Jesus is met with him with the multitude, and. There's a lot of Bobs here in this community. As I've traveled, I've seen a lot of Bobs, you know, people that don't always say the right thing or hear like they should or smell like they should or do the things that they should do. But I pray, Frankie, <laughs> he's got both hands raised back there. I pray that this be a church where the Bobs come. I pray we be a people that bring the Bobs with us. Because maybe they don't know. Maybe they don't recognize Jesus for who he is and Jesus for what he can do. So I pray we be the kind of people, well, it's Sunday, we're going to church, that we recognize, hey, when we come together, big things happen. When we come together, people get healed. People get blessed. People get saved. And that we would bring the Bobs with us each week. Because it, it not only speaks about our compassion, and I believe that's a fruit that we should all have, but it also speaks that we recognize the divinity of Jesus as well. And it reminds me of a chapter in Mark chapter 2, verse 4. four I'll paraphrase. Some friends bring a paralyzed man to see Jesus so he may be healed. Now, they didn't have fancy wheelchairs back then. They carried him on his mat. You ever carry a grown man on his mat? Well, either have I, but <laughs> you can imagine. So as they bring him in, they find another big crowd. And they couldn't get the man inside where Jesus was. 
So what did they do? They brought the man on the roof. It's one thing to carry a man on his mat, but to get him on a roof and to cut a hole in the roof and to lower the man down. Those are people with compassion. So in Mark 7, we find the people fighting through the multitude to get Bob in front of Jesus. Did anybody ever fight to get you in front of Jesus? Was there somebody in your life that kept praying and believing even when you didn't? That kept interceding for you when you didn't? Who would not relent until you had that interaction? Aren't you glad they did? Aren't you glad they didn't give up on you? I pray that we could be those kind of people as well. People that won't give up on the bobs around us. Even if it's our enemy. I said, even if it's our enemy. So they bring Bob in front of Jesus. Now Jesus could have healed him right then. Right? He could have just touched the hem of his garment and be healed. Jesus didn't even need to be there for Bob to be healed. But the impact and the lesson on Jesus' healing in history wasn't just that he could heal or that he would heal. The lesson and the impact on history is how he healed and how he taught us in the healing. So the first thing Jesus does is he diagnoses the problem. He kind of looks him up and down and then he begins to remedy it. He actually gets Bob away. Now scholars believe that that is a sign of humility by Jesus. He didn't want to put himself on display. He didn't want to be seen as the witch doctor sort of coming into the town. But it was also to protect Bob. Like Bob had already been through quite a bit. And then he saw a chance to get him away. I would add to it that it helps to change his reception. Because if we're going to hear, a lot of that has to do with our frequency. So I believe Jesus led him away one-on-one -on -one to help change his frequency. I know a lot of people, I just don't hear from God. But it's like we got the boom box next to our ear of outside noise and inner chatter. And it's both. It's not just the noise around you. Well, Bob couldn't hear, but it didn't mean he didn't have inner chatter. Sometimes it's like we're trying to talk to the Lord. It's like trying to talk to somebody in a nightclub. Now, I know we're not a crowd of nightclubbers, but anybody ever been to a nightclub or a concert? You ever try to talk to somebody in a concert? You're screaming in their ears, trying to, huh? What? It's like you think you just asked somebody out on a date and what you really did is offer to loan them money and help them move. We need better reception. Say, I need better reception. So let's see what Jesus does. Jesus led him away from the crowd. This is verse 33. So they could be alone. He put his fingers into the man's ears. Then spitting on his own fingers, he touched the man's ears tongue I thought about inviting somebody up Brian maybe I thought about him and kind of showing what this is and I could touch my tongue and touch his tongue um, but I had Oreos this morning so it's probably not good you're a tough crowd today so what what's going on with this what is what 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 is this is is Jesus telling Bob to steal second base is he telling him to to throw a curveball it's sign language. He's speaking to him in sign language. Bob could not hear. He could barely speak, but he could see and he could feel. So Jesus spoke to him. He said, I'm going to give you my ears. I'm going to give you my speech. I'm going to loosen your tongue as my tongue under his authority. And that's what Jesus does. He takes our brokenness and makes us whole. He's like the ultimate scrapyard, if you don't mind me being crass for a minute, because that's essentially what he does. If we're driving a Pinto, he allows us to take the parts off a of Ferrari, does he not? He's like the ultimate organ donor. We could take our tired old broken selves and have LeBron James's arms or Peyton Manning's eyes. He makes us whole. Verse 34, it says, And looking up to heaven, he sighed and said, Afatha, which means be opened. So let's recap here a little bit. Let's recap what happened. So Jesus, Jesus got the man alone. 
he improved his reception and his frequency. Jesus revealed his authority to him. And then he communicated what he was going to do. And then he pulled out the scalpel and started cutting. No, he didn't. But that's what we expect, right? We always expect a healing is going to hurt. I tell you, there's no bigger crybaby than me at the dentist. Last time I had a tooth pulled, I walked through the lobby and said, Dead man walking! What Jesus does, he looks towards the heaven and sighs. And I believe that is what's relevant to this entire passage. Not just the healing. I believe what's relevant is the sigh. Some, some verses say that it is an inner groan. What it is, church, is a sigh of compassion. And some of us probably aren't used to a sigh of compassion. Has anybody sighed in your life? <sighs> we're, used to, we're used to sighs of disgust, are we not? We're used to groans of disappointment, are we not? Parents, teachers, friends, family, bosses, spouses, even pastors, they sigh in disappointment because they get sick of our stuff, sick of our lives, sick of our burdens and that we are a burden, sick of the condition of our lives. The people that are supposed to love us the most sigh at us just like our enemies. Am I preaching today? Am I preaching today? Yeah. Bob, the deaf man, he could not hear the disgust over the condition in his life, but he could feel it. And Jesus could feel it as well. Because the compassion in Jesus is this. He knows the ultimate plan of the Father is that you and that me and that all of us would not suffer would not suffer in ridicule, would not suffer in our sin. You see, for Bob, it wasn't just needing a healing in his ears. He needed a healing in his soul. To hear God, we need a healing in our souls and a healing from sin. You know, sin separates us from the voice of God. I'm reminded, of, I'm reminded of the veil of the temple that separated man from the tabernacle, man from the presence of God. And I said that veil was literally about four inches thick, 60 feet tall. And it was such a sacred place that when the high priest would enter, they would tie a rope to his foot. And if he had any sin in his life, that's why they tied a rope, that they would be pulling his body back out. One of the problems with us hearing the voice of God is sin. So when Jesus sighs, when we hear the sigh of Jesus, it's a sigh of compassion, but it's also a sigh of recognizing his mission. He's looking at Bob and he's sighing. He's looking up to the heavens and he's saying, I see why you sent me. I see why the mission is so. Because it's the Son of Man. Jesus could not possibly walk around and touch every single person who is under the spell and duress of sin and disease. But as the Son of God, he could be the cure that eradicated the deadliness of sin and disease in the world. I love the gospel. I so love the gospel. Because Jesus not only sighed for us, Jesus sighed with us. Jesus sighed with us. His mission wasn't just to save us, but to know us. To walk in our shoes. Jesus walked in our shoes for 33 years he was born like us he nursed like us he cried like us he needed like us he was tempted by us he played like us he hurt like us he wept like us why because ever since the cross he's been praying for us and interceding for us and the only way he could do that is to have walked in our shoes 
to know what it is like to be you and you and you and me. You see, this encounter with Bob wasn't just that Bob get in front of Jesus, but also Jesus to get in front of Bob's condition. Because I don't know that Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be deaf or exactly what it's like to have a speech impediment. The entire entirety of the mission of Jesus is to know our condition, but also to become our condition. He who knew no sin became sin, so that we may become his righteousness. I love how, this is 2 Corinthians 5.21, I love how it says it in the, in the message paraphrase. It says, God put the wrong on him who never did anything wrong, so we could be put right with God. When God sighed, it was an acknowledgement of the mission. When he spoke the healing word of Fatha, it wasn't just for Bob, but it was for us. It wasn't just for ears to be open, it was for heaven to be open for us. Nobody knows your condition better than Jesus. Nobody knows what it's like to walk in your shoes, even you, Kevin. Nobody knows what it's like to walk in your shoes like Jesus. Well, what about being homeless? He did it. What about being hungry? He was it. What about being tempted? He was, and he did not sin. What about to be ridiculed? He was ridiculed in front of everybody. What about being persecuted? He was persecuted in the worst possible way. He became your sin. Each and every, thank you, brother. He became your sin. He became your shame. He became your lust and your greed and your pride. He became your addiction. He became that feeling every morning, well, hopefully not every morning, those mornings when you wake up and you just, I wronged that person, that guilt, that shame, that condemnation. He became that. Why did he become that? Because when it came down to your punishment, your beating, your crown of thorns, your judgment, your sentence, that he may become that for you, that he may take that. So he may substitute himself on the cross for each and every one of you. Why? Why? Because when he hung on the cross, he carried each and every one of our sins. Every sin you've ever committed, every lie you're living in now, and I'm living in now, every sin, every stumble that I'm going to have for the rest of my life, he carried that on himself. All of our junk, he carried that on the cross. He came underneath. He lived a life like this, so he did not miss even us. He could have come down, just checked in at the Hilton, and it was time to go to the cross. They could have taken him. He could have done his thing and gone back. But he learned what it was like to live the life of each and every one of us. Because when he hung on that cross, he inoculated our sinful blood with his holy blood so that we might be healed. Do you understand that? Our sinful blood, every last drop of it, he inoculated himself as the cure. He took it upon himself so that by his blood pouring out over us, that we might be healed. Isaiah 53 says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Let me bring it home. Because I'm talking about hearing from God and then I'm talking about the gospel. Let me tell you what the gospel is. It's that we hear from God. That God would open our ears from sin that we may hear him. So his promises may become real. So he may lead us through the will. Are you tired of waking up in the wilderness? I know this is the wilderness. But it's not our sentence. 
Our promise is a land of promises. Our promise is a land of blessings. And he opens our ears so that we may hear. And in Mark 15, verse 37, this is in the Amplified. Follow me on this. This is where I'm closing today. It says, but Jesus uttered a loud cry. He's at the end of his time on the cross. Six hours of, of just humility. His own mother watching him hang from a cross. Prisoners around him mocking him. People mocking him. Guards mocking him. Stabbing him. Putting vinegar in his mouth. And at the very end, in his very last breaths, it says, Jesus uttered a loud cry and breathed out his last voluntary, sovereignly dismissing and releasing his spirit from his body. It's a lot there. It's the amplified version. And I say all that to say, in submission of the plan, of God's plan, in submission for his mission, he released his spirit. And I want to go back and look at what did Jesus utter in this loud cry? Some versions say, it is finished. Those were the words, and I believe that because it is acknowledging Father, the mission is over. He's looking up to the Father and he's acknowledging Him. I have fulfilled my mission. Their blood is now in me. And I will purify them, every last one of them, who are under my blood. But I want to read something else because this is Mark's admission and we're reading Mark's account. Peter's eyewitness account. Peter was eyewitness at the cross. And I want to look at this uttered a loud cry. And I believe if you can attach a word to that, it's this, afatha. It's an Aramaic word. Be opened. As Jesus was taking his last breaths, he's saying, Father, take my spirit, mission accomplished. Now be opened. Yes, our ears, but let heaven be open. Let thy kingdom come, Father. Let your will be done. And in the very next verse, the very next verse we see, it says this, it said the veil of the holiest of holy, the veil, the four inch wide veil, the moment Jesus died, the veil was torn from top to bottom. And what does that signify? It signified heaven was opened. It signified what separated our ears from God's voice was now gone. Church, you can hear from God. The veil was torn when you are under his blood. When you are under his blood.